Thank you very much, choir, for those wonderful, beautiful songs that remind us of the faithfulness of God and His amazing grace, without which none of us would be here. But we thank God because He is our God who is faithful, who loves us and demonstrated that love that didn't just talk about it, he showed it through the great sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins. And so, good morning, Heart of Worship Community Church. My wife and I are glad to be back. We thank you for your prayers for us. We thank you for keeping us in your prayers and all the travels that we have been blessed with. It's all, again, by the goodness of the Lord. Originally, we wanted to go to Israel, but they had this uh, travel protocols that we can't because we're unvaccinated. And so we just opted to go to Petra in Egypt. But then at the last minute, towards April, Israel changed their protocols. So that's... Reina's bucket list, and so we added it in the last minute, and all again by the grace and the goodness of God. And what a blessing it is to be back, and we thank you, even for our uh, dad, Ray, and mom, Linda, in taking care and watching over our girls while we were away, making sure that they, be they behaved. <laughs> and... Um, Thank God for the church, for your continued support in the work and the ministry of the Lord and coming here, knowing that you don't come here for me or because of me, but because you love the Lord and you worship the Lord and you honor Him. So I thank the Lord for the elders, Pastor Homer and Elder Barry, for holding the fort, so to speak, and the deacons that assisted even in the worship service last week. To God be all the glory. So welcome. Again, our, not our guest, but uh, part of us, Reverend Paul Shaki and his wife, Barbara. And we also have uh, another guest. I believe her name is Virginia. We'd like to welcome you and thank you for joining us this morning. I believe she lives around here. What a blessing it is for you, for us, for you to come and join us this morning. Having said all that, let us get our Bibles and turn to the book or letter of Ephesians, chapter 6. And for the sake of context, we'll read from verse 10 up to verse 14. And if you are able to stand, I invite you to stand as we honor God in the reading of His Word, again in Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 10, where it reads, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Let us pray. Lord, we give to you our hearts, speak to us, and let your Holy Spirit do his wonderful work in renewing our minds, in the process of transforming our lives, so that we will no longer be conformed to this world. As a matter of fact, you have called us your saints, set apart to be holy and blameless. 
and to live a life that is worthy, not only of the calling, but worthy of your name, to live in victory, the victory that is in Christ Jesus. And so, Lord God, we commit to you our lives, even as we receive your word with gladness. May your will be done, even as you be glorified today, even right now, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You may all be seated. The title for today's message is Armor All and Win. Some of you who are old enough like me know what Armor All is. It's that thing that they put on furnitures and even tires to protect the particular uh, thing from dusts and anything that would dirty it, so to speak. So we're in the final stretch in this journey through the letter of Paul to the Ephesians, where in the first three chapters, we remember that Paul taught the church, which includes us today. He taught us of who we are in Christ, the calling that God gave us in Christ. Remember, we are saints, God's holy people, people who are set apart, chosen to be holy and blameless in His sight, meaning to be different. Children of God by adoption, by redemption with the precious blood of Jesus, marked and sealed by the Holy Spirit of God. This is who we are in Christ, and this is the calling that we have received. We were not worthy of any of these spiritual blessings because we all have sinned. Remember, we were dead in sin and lived according to the sinful desires of our flesh. But God, because of His great love for us, made us alive in Christ Jesus and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms. In other words, God gave us a position of authority as Christ has that authority. Even over the forces of evil that lure and deceive people to live in sin. So now in Christ, we can live in His righteousness, not in religious righteousness, but His righteousness, the only righteousness that is acceptable to God. We can live in His righteousness and in the abundance of His goodness, even in the victory of Christ over sin and death. All of this by the grace, the sovereign grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ. We who were not worthy, were made worthy in Christ. And then from chapters 4 to 6, we are instructed, even commanded, to walk worthy of the calling we have received. Remember, to walk worthy means to live our lives that is deserving of the calling that we have received. What is that calling? We are saints, called to live lives that are holy or set apart. That is to say, different. Different from who we used to be. We were sinners who were dead in sin, living lives according to the sinful desires of the flesh. Now, having received life in Christ and, throw, and having been called saints in Christ, we are instructed and commanded to live lives that deserve or matches who we are. Worthy of the calling we have received. And so as we have learned from chapters 4, verses 1 to 16, to walk worthy means we are to live in unity in the body of Christ as His church, pursuing the goal of maturity. And then from verses 17 to chapter 5, verse 21, we are to live in purity by imitating God, by living not as unbelievers, but by walking in love as Christ loved us. Walking as children of light, walking as wise, and walking in harmony. And lastly, we are to live in victory. God wants us to live in victory. Of course, by that statement, the, the, it is implied that there is a struggle, a battle. And that is the spiritual battle that we are involved in. 
that we need to understand that as children of God and as believers and followers of Christ, we are not on the defeated side, but we are on the victory side. Christ, the victor, has won the war for us, the war over sin and death. So now we can live in victory over sin, over the power of sin. We are not bound by it. We have been set free so that we can have victory even over the daily battles or challenges that we face and go through each day. Know that if you are in Christ, you are on the winning side, the victory side. Listen, the devil is a defeated enemy. So we don't have to fear or worry about him, for we have victory in Christ. However, the devil is proud and deluded and wouldn't accept defeat. And so he continues to rage against God's holy people. As 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 and 9 says, that it says there, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of the believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. As mentioned earlier, Christ has won the war, and the devil is a defeated enemy, yet he continues to attack God's children. He wants to steal and to kill and destroy the believers and followers of Christ. And that's why we have these daily battles, daily struggles in our Christian walk. And the devil, listen, the devil is relentless and wants to take us down for us to live in defeat by making us doubt God and doubt His Word. The devil wants to discourage us and if possible to make us stop trusting God, prevent us from following His Word, tempting us in every way for us to fall into sin. Because the devil knows that if we fall into sin, we will live in defeat. So listen, although the victory is won and victory is made available to us, we can lose in the daily battles. We can fall into temptations and the tricks or the schemes that the devil hurls against us in the struggles of life. It doesn't mean that we will lose our salvation. Never. But we can lose the joy of our salvation when we fall into sin. We can lose the peace. We can lose the opportunity of serving God and being useful to Him. That's why we need, we need to lead, live in victory that is made available to us, the victory that Christ has given us. But how? How do we live in victory? Well, that's part of the message last Sunday. If you were here last Sunday or listened to the excellent message that Pastor Homer delivered, to live in victory begins with being strong in the Lord. And you remember that in verse 10. In verse 10 where it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Be strong in the Lord, not in yourself, not in your opinion, not in your reasoning, not in human wisdom or the wisdom of this world, not in the culture and its traditions, not in religion or superstitious beliefs nor anything of this world. To be strong in the Lord means to draw strength from Him in who He is. Be strong in who He is. He is God, the Son, the God of our salvation, the Savior, the only Savior, our Redeemer. Remember, He is the Creator, the Almighty God. He is Lord, our Sovereign, our King. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. The power of His might that is seen in creation, even in salvation, in redemption, in His resurrection, that is all based and declared in His Word, which really demonstrate the power of His Word. 
So to be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might is to be strong in the Word of God. Because the Word of God is solid rock, a firm foundation that will never be shaken. Remember, be strong in who Jesus Christ is. Be strong in what the Bible is, the Word of God, our authority, our standard. If there is anything that the devil will attack and make us weak on, is the person of Christ and His Word. The devil will attack who Jesus is. He will attack the authority, the veracity, meaning the truthfulness of God's Word, the Bible. And this is what the devil and his evil forces will make us doubt about. The divinity of Jesus, the love of God, the goodness of the Lord, the faithfulness of His Word. This is the devil's basic strategy or scheme. But again, we are on the victory side. And we will live, we will live in victory if, if we will trust in the Lord with all our hearts, if we listen to God and follow Him, and not the devil. And that is why in verses 11 to 12, where it says, Put on the full armor of God, so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces in the heavenly realm. This ought to remind us that as believers and followers of Christ, we are in a spiritual battle and that we are soldiers in the army of God, in the army of Christ. In other words, it's not an option. We're in the battle and we need to fight in victory, to fight as conquerors, as victors and not as victims. God wants us to act or live in victory and not in defeat. But we need to remember or recognize that our battle or our fight is not against flesh and blood. In other words, we're not fighting with people, but with ideologies, both human and demonic ideologies that influence the minds of people, people who are not strong in the Lord, who are not strong and standing firm in the Word of God. That's why we don't fight according to the flesh or the things of this world. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 and 5 says, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. So stand, stand firm. To stand basically means to take your position. Where do you stand? What are you standing on, spiritually speaking? What do you believe? And what is the basis of your belief? To walk or to live in victory, you need to know your position. You need to know where you stand. It's important to know what you believe and why you believe. In other words, the basis of your belief. What is your authority? For some, their basis or authority is their reason, human wisdom or knowledge. The problem with that is human wisdom or reason is limited. It's unable to grasp the spiritual. And even the books that they write has to be revised after years. Just like science has to be revised. For some, their authority is experience. The problem with that is, people have real experience with what is false, even demonic. Like for example, the Hindus and those involved in Eastern religions, they experience a form of peace, a form of ecstasy, elation, and it's real experience but it's false. For others, their basis or authority for truth is what or how they feel about a matter. 
The problem with feelings or emotions is they are unstable because it changes. Listen, there's only one solid ground. There's only one firm foundation that can never be shaken. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ and His Word. And so it's important not only to know what you believe, but why? The basis. And the basis of our authority or the basis or our authority, why we believe what we believe is the Bible, the Word of God. The Word of God is the solid rock foundation of our faith, even Jesus Christ, who is the living Word. He is our authority, and His Word is our basis, why we believe what we believe. Jesus is the solid rock on which we stand. As the song says, all other ground is sinking sand, such as human wisdom, human philosophy, religion, culture, society. All other crowns or bases, they are shifting, they are changing, they are unstable, unreliable, they are all sinking sand. Only Jesus in His Word is firm and stable. It endures forever. It is a sure foundation. First Peter chapter 1 24 says, for all men and everything that man produces are like grass and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall. But the word of the Lord remains. It stands forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. If you don't know what you believe or why, or if the basis of your belief is not Jesus Christ and His Word, not only will you have a difficulty or struggle in your battles, you will fail. So stand firm. Know what you believe and why you believe and be strong. Putting on the full armor of God. Not just one piece of the armor, but the full armor of God. Armor all and win so that you may be able to stand your ground as verse 13 says, where it says, therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you've done everything, you remain standing. It would be foolish, if not suicide, for a soldier to go in a battle without any armor or any protection at all. And as believers and followers of Christ, remember, we are involved in a spiritual battle, a battle that we do not see, but it is real battle nevertheless. And I keep repeating, we are on the victory side, but it does not mean that we can be complacent or that we do not need to be prepared or equipped for battle. No. As a matter of fact, God wants us to be vigilant alert and watchful, prepared and ready for battle. Unfortunately, some in the church are complacent. They are not vigilant. Their attitude is just like, uh, whatever. Yeah. You're bound to lose or fall if you have that kind of attitude. Be alert and be vigilant and be sincere and committed to the Lord and His Word in the battle that you face or go through. How? By putting on the full armor of God. God gave us the armor to put on so that we can walk in victory. So put it on, which means it's not on us automatically. It is available for us to put on, to apply, to live in, but we need to intentionally put it on. So what is the armor of God? What are the different pieces or parts of the armor of God that we need to put on? Well, back to our text in chapter 6. In verse 14 to verse 17, you'll see the full armor of God. The belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the shoes of the gospel of peace, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit. 
But for this morning, we'll just take the first part. Unless you want to stay till 5 o'clock. Is it okay? Oh, okay. We'll just take the first part. And the first part is called the belt of truth. Listen, the devil is a liar. And everything that comes from him is a lie. Remember that. In many occasions, he would speak half-truths. In other words, he may use Bible verses out of context, manipulated, designed to deceive people and take them captive. This is a major scheme or strategy of the devil to deceive people. He is a liar and the father of lies. The devil is a master deceiver. John chapter 8 verse 44 says, as Jesus was being confronted by some of the Jewish leaders, he says, why do you not understand what am I saying? It is because you cannot hear my word. You are of your father, the devil. And you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature for he is a liar and the father of lies. And that's why the first thing mentioned as our first line of defense is the truth, the belt of truth. Most likely when Paul wrote this letter, he had in mind a Roman soldier whom he and everyone else in the time period were very familiar with as Roman soldiers were everywhere. Since Paul was in prison when he wrote this letter, most likely there was a Roman guard near him or beside him guarding him. Now one of the things that a Roman soldier would put on in his armor is a belt. What does a belt do? Well, primarily a belt holds things up. Like for us, it holds our pants up. I don't know about those who live in, you know, ghetto and their pants are like. They even have a belt, but it's, it's up here, uh, down here rather. But in the time period, men, including a soldier, they wore a tunic. A tunic is like a dress for men. They didn't have pants at the time. Men wore a dress called tunic. Today, we have a kaftan. In Israel and Middle East today, you will see men wear a kaftan. I actually almost bought one. And I thought I would wear it today, this Sunday, even as I give the message. But then I thought you might not believe the message. I think I've lost it. But that's what even the soldiers wore. They wore their tunic that just went around the knee. But when they go to battle, it's important or necessary for them to tie it up with a belt so that the soldier can be agile and move about with speed and prevent the enemy from taking advantage of him because of those distractions. The belt is also used to hold weapons like a sword or a dagger in place and accessible for the soldier's immediate use. In other words, the belt is put on to hold things together in place, which gives the soldier the sense of confidence and stability. Isn't that what it gives us also when we have a belt on, especially if we have loose pants, like when you pass through the security checkpoint in that airport and they ask you to remove the belt and your, your pants is actually loose and you, you don't want to remove your belt, especially mine, because, you know, I might be like, yeah, what's up? But then when you have the belt on, there's that sense of confidence and stability. It's like we're prepared and ready to handle anything. When we don't have the belt on, there's an encumbrance. In other words, a distraction. Something that makes the movement or progress difficult. And that's why a Roman soldier puts on a belt. When the soldier puts on the belt, he's basically saying he is ready and prepared for battle. And it also shows his commitment and sincerity in fighting the battle. And that's one of the important points in this. If we want to win our battles, 
We need to be ready and prepared for it and be sincere and committed and fight to win and not have a whatever attitude. You know, it's okay. Putting on the belt signals your preparedness and declares your sincerity and commitment to fight, to win. Listen, if you are going to engage in a battle and want to live in victory, you need to have confidence, stability, and making sure that things in your life are in place and held together. How? By the truth, the belt of truth. The piece of armor that would hold things together and give us a stability and confidence is the truth. But what is truth? Well, first, here's a definition. Truth is an absolute objective standard by which everything is measured. It is absolute because it is perfect and independent. It is objective because it is dealing with facts or conditions without distortions by personal feelings or prejudice or interpretations. In other words, truth is not about what or how you feel. It's not even what you believe. Truth stands on its own. It is not dependent on what people feel or think. It is not dependent on sincerity either. Remember that one can be sincere and still be sincerely wrong. There are many people like that today. They are sincere in their beliefs, but they are sincerely wrong. Truth remains truth, whether people agree or disagree, whether people accept or reject, whether people believe it or deny it. Truth is the standard that will hold you up and put everything else in place. You need to wrap the truth around you to uphold you, especially when you're going through the battles or struggles in your life. So what is this standard or truth? Well, Jesus said in John 14 verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus also said in his prayer to the Father in John 17 verse 17, where he said, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. This is what the devil attacks first and foremost. The truth of who Jesus is and the truth of his word, the Bible. The devil's strategy is to make you question or doubt the truth. God is not really good. I mean, look at what you're going through. God doesn't really love you or care for you. Oh, come on, Jesus is not really the only way. That's being too narrow-minded. The Bible is not really God's word. It's only written by men. And you're not really called or chosen of God. I mean, you're not a saint. Are you kidding? You're kidding yourself. God really has not forgiven you. You have to do something to be forgiven. This is the scheme, the strategy of the devil. And this is what the enemy tries to do. The devil wants to discourage you and wants you to question or doubt the truth by telling you lies. Lies, lies, lies. Yeah. Remember, the devil is a liar and the father of lies. He is a master deceiver. And if you don't know the truth, you can and will be deceived. The problem with being deceived is you don't know you're deceived. That's the problem of being deceived. You don't know that you are deceived. You might think that you're believing what is true or right and even be sincere about your belief. But when you go to the Word of God, you are, you are wrong. That's why we need to go to the authority, the Word of God, because it is absolute, objective standard by which we can measure everything and know the truth. Listen. If you don't know the truth, which is God's word, the devil can and will deceive you, defeat you, and hold you captive with his lies. And the only thing that can and will deliver you or release you is the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior, our deliverer. How? Through his word, which is the truth. 
Remember what Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 31 to 32, where it says, To the Jews who had believed in him, Jesus said, If you hold on to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Listen, truth is not something abstract. It's, it's not unknowable. Truth can be known. Jesus said, you can know the truth and you will know the truth. God wants you to know the truth because the truth will set you free. That's why you and I need to immerse ourselves in the truth, which is the word of God. So that we live not by what or how we feel. Not by human wisdom or reason. We don't live by what is popular, but by what is absolute. That which is solid rock and stable in other words, will never change. And that is the Word of God. Let the Word of God fill you, as Colossians chapter 3, verse 16 says, where it says, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. What does 2 Peter chapter 3, 18 say? Grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Let the Word of God fill you. Grow in it. Live in it. Be equipped with it. 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17 says, All, not just half or most, but all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. This is what we need to wrap ourselves with in the battles and struggles in life. Truth, the belt of truth. It will, it will put and hold everything in place and will give you confidence and stability. Unfortunately, there are many, even in the so-called Christian community, who do not subscribe to the word of God or the truth of His word. Many today live by the philosophy or the ideology that says truth is relative. What does it mean truth is relative? doesn't mean that it's your relative. Truth is relative, meaning that you can, if you can relate with it, then good. If you can't relate it with it, then it's okay. Just find something that you can relate with. Truth is whatever you want to believe. To each his own. That's called rel relativism. Whatever works for you, fine. Whatever works for me, well, you know, fine. We're happy. The problem with that is it's not true. Because truth is absolute. Whether you believe it or not, again, whether you agree with it or not, whether you accept it or not, it is not dependent on you for anything. Truth remains truth simply because it is the Word of God. It stands on its own. I mean, think of gravity. Imagine if we live in a world where people have this mindset about gravity to each his own. You can believe what you want to believe about gravity. You may say, I believe I can fly. Well, you can believe that all you want. But the truth and the reality of gravity will give you a rude awakening, or should I say, put you to a permanent sleep, if not injury. Gravity works no matter what you think, no matter how you feel, no matter if you're sincere in your belief or not. Gravity remains and it works regardless of time, regardless of where you are in this world. So with the truth of the Word of God, it works. It is absolute. It works regardless, again, whether you believe it or not. It's not dependent on you for anything. It remains true and it stands on its own. Truth is absolute. The sad thing is many people in every generation, especially in the generation of today. What is the generation of today called? Gen Z? The millennials? The generation of today think that the Bible is not the absolute truth, that the Bible is not standard, it's not the authority. They think or even believe 
that you can have your own truth. And you can have my, and I can have my own truth. Again, the problem with that is this. If you can have your truth and I can have my truth, is that it makes everyone an authority, which in reality makes none of us authority. Everyone can't be right, and no one is wrong. There is an absolute truth. There is an authority. And having no authority or absolute standard creates confusion. Not only confusion, but instability, which is what is happening in the world today in many people's lives. We live in a world where there is so much confusion, instability, if not insanity. Where those who are supposed to be adults and are supposed to be wise can't even define what a woman is. And there are those who believe that man can menstruate and can get pregnant. If that's not confusion, it's insanity or utter foolishness. Why is this happening? Because they don't have an authority or standard that is solid or that which remains, such as the Bible. Their authority or standard is that which changes from time to time. It just goes along with whatever is fashionable, whatever is trending, what is acceptable to the society or culture. They go with the flow. Such standing is unstable as it is dependent on what or how they feel, what people think, what culture says, what the opinion of the majority is. Listen, truth is truth. God's word, the Bible, is truth. There is truth, absolute truth. And because there is truth, remember, something else has to be false. The sad reality of today is, even in the Christian community is, many believe what is false. Because again, their standard or their authority is not the enduring word of God. Their authority is what or how they feel and what they think. What the celebrities say, what popular opinion is, what's trending on social media, what they see and hear on TikTok and on other platforms. They go with these, what is popular as though it's the standard. And why is that? Well, one reason is because of fear, fear of people instead of fear of God. Many, even in the Christian community, are afraid of people. Afraid of what people might do to them or call them. Call them names, mock them, persecute them, or even cancel them. They're interested in saving their lives and do not want to lose their lives for Christ. Their comfort and happiness is more important to them than following Jesus and living for Christ. They don't believe what Jesus said that we gain life by losing our lives for His sake. Therefore, they try to please people more than they want to please God. We're living in a time where many in the Christian community want to please everybody. They want everybody to like them. I mean, they would rather please the world and be accepted by the world so that they tolerate every idea out there even if it's false. Philosophies and ideologies of the LGBTQ, same-sex marriage, abortion, living together and enjoying the benefits of marriage even though they are not married, traveling together, staying in one room in a hotel and they're not married. It's fashionable. Celebrities do it. My friend did it. These are the beliefs and practices of the world. And they may not realize it, but when the so-called Christians do these things, they're actually saying that they're okay with the world or the ways of the world. They're saying that they want to be friends with the world, which means they love the world. The problem with that is what the Bible says in James chapter 4, verse 4. Remember what it says there? You adulterous people, 
Don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. How about 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 to 17, where it says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. In other words, you don't love God. Even though you may say you love God and come to church and sing songs, I love you, Lord God. The love of the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, which is the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. And the world and its desires pass away. But whoever does the will of God lives forever. And that's the problem with many Christians in the church today. Christians who want to be accepted or to be liked by the world. That they are not able to call truth, truth. And call lies, lies. So that it creates confusion and instability. And many don't know what's true anymore. They don't have discernment. What is discernment? Discernment is having insight. In other words, being able to perceive. It's the ability to know and understand right from wrong. As one preacher said, I believe it's uh, Spurgeon. It's the ability to know what is right and what is almost right. And that is what's going on today. Where many take God's word and mix their opinions and interpret God's words and how they feel about it. So that it sounds right and feels right. But the problem is, it's not right. Your feelings and your opinion does not make it right. Don't equate your opinion or, or your emotions with God's word. You see, many, you see many of that happening in social media where they will quote a verse from the word and yet they will mix it with an ideology or philosophy that is of this world. And what that does is it creates confusion, instability, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. Listen, it's time for us, the true believers and followers of Christ, to wrap the belt of truth around us and buckle it up real tight and stand in the confidence of the truth of God's word so that we may be able to call truth, truth, and lies, lies. Not in a selfish way, Self-righteous attitude, but with a loving yet firm stand so that we can live in victory over the spiritual battle we're in. Put on the belt of truth. It will ground you, stabilize you, give you confidence. It will even give you discernment. In the end, truth is Christ Jesus himself. For he said, he said the most exclusive the most intolerant, if you want to use that word, the most narrow statement ever said. Remember what he said? He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus didn't say, just find your way. You can go to the Father on your own. Any way will work as long as you're sincere. Nope. That's a lie. The truth is there is only one way, and that way is Jesus. That's the truth. Remember, truth is a person, and that person has a name. His name is Jesus. You want to know the truth? Jesus said, I am the truth. So if you want to know the truth and live in the truth so that you live your life not by what you think, Think or how you feel, but by the word of God and what God said in his word, then follow Jesus. Wrap the truth of Jesus in his word like a belt around you. Let God's truth put everything in place and let it hold you up so that you can live in the strength of his word, live in the confidence of his truth, and live in the victory of the Lord. There's more. 
but we will continue next Sunday. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word for us, how you love us so much that not only you forgave us of our sins and given us life in Christ, but you have given us your word, the Holy Spirit speaking to us, even in us, the one who teaches and guides us and empowers us, not only to know the truth, but to live in the truth so that we can live in victory. I pray, Lord God, as we go through the armor of God, the spiritual armor that you have given us, that, again, it will not only comfort us and encourage us, but that it will open our eyes so that truly, Lord God, we can live our lives in victory and in a way that honors and truly glorifies you. For you are worthy, O Lord, our God. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, because it is you who made it all possible for us to have this life, life that is that you called for us to be holy and blameless in your sight. And so, Lord God, we continue to honor you, to worship you, even now as we give our tithes and offerings and sing our closing song. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. I'm so